passage. So if you have a copy of God's Word, go ahead and open up to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to be looking at one verse together. But we're actually going to be covering a lot of things today as we consider God's Word and as we consider this whole series that we've been going through. We've been going through a series called How to Be the Church. And if you'll recall, we decided that to be the church is more than just going to church, right? It's more than just doing church. It's something that we are. As believers in Christ, we are the church, his church, his family. And we heard from God's word that in order to be the church, you have to follow the leader. And in order to be the church, last week we heard that we need to invest in community. We're learning that in order to be the church, you have to gather with the church. Jesus is our leader. And when we gather together, we worship our leader, the one who, who washes us in his blood, cleanses us of all of our unrighteousness and filthy deeds. Right? He makes us clean. And we gather together to worship this one who leads us. And we invest in the community that he has adopted us into. We, we want to see thriving life happen in the midst of his people. But the last thing I want us to consider about being the church is the idea of being a disciple-making disciple. Being a disciple-making disciple. And you might would expect for us to go to Matthew chapter 28, where Jesus gives what we call the Great Commission, the last words to his disciples where he tells them to go and make disciples. But I'm going to assume that we've already heard about that, especially because I just said it. And we're going to focus on another portion of Scripture where you see somebody else telling another disciple how to keep making disciples. But a bigger picture of what we're doing here this morning is really just thinking through how we can be disciple-making disciples and how that all ties together with this idea of being the church. What is it that we're really, really supposed to be doing in order to be who we are? So we're going to land the plane on that this morning as well. So the way I want to handle this is by asking us three questions. The first question is, what does it mean to be a disciple-making disciple? I want us to consider together what it really means to be a disciple-making disciple. We've all heard that giving a man a fish feeds him for a day. But teaching a man how to fish feeds him for a lifetime. But even better than that, if you teach a man how to fish, and then you teach that man how to teach others, you've not only fed him for a lifetime, but you fed a whole community. I think that's what Jesus is getting at when he calls his disciples to go and make disciples. And what I want us to see is look together in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and just look at this one verse, verse 2, where the Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy, who is now an elder in Ephesus, he says to him in verse 2, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Did you hear that? He says, the things that you've heard me speak in the presence of many other people, 
Timothy, I want you to entrust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach other people also, who will then be able to teach other people also, who will then be able to teach other people also. You see, what Jesus expects his disciples to do, and if you're a disciple, what that means is you're a follower of Christian. So if you give yourself the title Christian, then you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Okay, just making that clear. If you call yourself a Christian, that means by definition that you are calling yourself a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ. And Jesus expects his disciples to make more disciples. That's what he says as plain as day in Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20 that I already mentioned where he says what? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. And don't forget, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Jesus wants his disciples to make more disciples. So that means that if you are a Christian, you are not only a disciple, you are a disciple maker. You might be a bad disciple maker, but you're still a disciple maker, whether you want to be or not. Because the one that you claim to follow, Jesus Christ, has told us to go make disciples. Go make followers of Jesus. And what was his plan? How did Jesus decide, all right, here's my golden plan for how we're going to reach the entire world? What did he set up? What structure? What process did Jesus put into place to say, go and, and make this happen all over the world? His plan was that his disciples would make disciples and that those disciples would make disciples and that those disciples would make disciples and that those disciples would make disciples etc so on and so forth that's why you're here because somebody shared the gospel with you somebody invested Jesus Christ into your life told you about what Jesus did to wash away your sins by his blood that was spilled on the cross. And you know what? Somebody told that person. And somebody before them told that person. And somebody before them told that person. And it goes all the way back to these 12 men who were told by Jesus to go make disciples. And one of the very best of the disciple makers in all of history was the Apostle Paul. This guy just, he would, he, he, ate, drank, slept, everything was discipleship for him. And what happened was Paul was going on his second missionary journey, which you can see in Acts chapter 16, and he meets up with this young fellow named Timothy. He's in this town called Lystra. He meets Timothy and he's like, man, this guy, Timothy puts his faith in Christ and, and Paul's like, this guy, he... he He's called to go with us, and he brings Timothy with him. And Timothy travels with Paul and Silas, and he ends up meeting Titus and all these other people, but he travels with Paul and Silas to Philippi. Any of you that have ever been to Bulgaria on a mission trip, you've probably been down into Philippi, right? You were there where Timothy was, and he saw Paul and Silas get arrested and thrown in prison and then miraculously rescued from jail. Timothy was there. He saw that. Timothy traveled with them from Philippi to Athens to Corinth and then to Ephesus, constantly sharing the gospel, finding more people to make new disciples. And eventually, Timothy becomes one of the pastors, one of the elders in the church of Ephesus. And this letter that we hear Paul writing to him, telling him to, to teach other people how to teach other people the gospel... Paul is actually in prison in Rome. And his good friend Timothy, one of his people that he had shared the gospel with and trained how to be a minister of the gospel, is writing to him while Paul is 
about to be executed for his faith. They stayed in touch because they loved each other. But Paul, what's interesting, Paul wasn't, woe is me, I'm about to die. You know, I hope things are going good for you. No, Paul is there. Timothy, listen up, man. I'm coming to the end. Don't you dare give up, son. That's what Paul's saying to Timothy. Don't you dare give up. In fact, what I want you to do is I want you to invest the gospel into other men. Do what you've seen me doing, Timothy. Don't stop. Yes, I'm about to die, but I don't care. I'm about to go be with the Lord. I'm super excited about that. Paul was, Paul was elated to go be with Christ in heaven. He wasn't afraid. He was excited. He knew this was what was going to happen one day. And he says, Timothy, don't you stop. Don't you stop now. You need to make more disciples. And you need to teach them how to do it too. Because they need to hear about salvation in Christ. Okay, so that's what Paul was telling Timothy. And that's what Timothy's supposed to do. What does that mean for us? I want to break it down into really simple things for us. The first that Paul tells Timothy is this. You need to know the gospel. How, how, what does it mean to be a disciple-making disciple? It means you need to know the gospel. Right? What does he tell Timothy? He says, the things that you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. What were those things? What were the things that Paul was constantly telling everyone everywhere that he went about? It was Jesus. All you need to do is go read the book of Acts and to see how he goes into Athens and he's like, you're worshiping all these other gods? Well, let me tell you about the one God that you're missing out on. He's the one that created everything. And he's teaching them all these things in Athens and they're like amazed. And then he says, and guess what? This one God, he came down in human flesh and he died and came back to life. And some of them were like, this guy's crazy. And some of them were like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Timothy knew about that. Timothy saw Paul in Ephesus preaching the gospel. In Philippi, preaching the gospel. Everywhere Paul went, preaching the gospel. And Timothy knew the gospel. He knew that Paul was preaching some of these things that he later writes to Timothy and Titus. He calls them the the trustworthy sayings. One of the things he says in 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. What's a part of the gospel? Jesus came to save you from your sin. Yeah, man, we need that. Don't lie and say you don't have sin, shame, and guilt. Yes, you do. We all do. I do. You do. We all have sin, shame, and guilt. And Jesus came to pay the price for that and to cleanse you of all of that so you don't have to feel the weight of your sins anymore. He came to save sinners. What else? 1 Timothy 4, 8 through 9. Godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life. It also, for the life to come, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. When Jesus saves you from your sins, you don't stay who you were. You become someone new. You become someone godly. Not perfectly godly. None of us here in church pretend that we're perfect. And if you're pretending that you're perfect, just cut it out. Because none of us are. We're all sinful. We all mess up. But the difference is, is we don't, we don't accept our sinfulness. We say, man, Lord, forgive me of my sinfulness And help me to do better next time. By the power of Jesus Christ in me, he's making us godly for this life and for the life to come. Third, in 2 Timothy 2.11, the the saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with him, we will also live with him. Second Baptist Church. One thing that Timothy knew about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that Jesus rose from the grave. Listen, half of y'all, probably more than half of y'all grew up in church. The rest of you maybe didn't grow up in church, but you know that Jesus rose from the grave. And we all just go, yeah, 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 cool, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is amazing. 
It's insane. The world thinks we're literally insane for believing that. But it's true that Jesus rose from the grave. And the reason why that's so vitally important is because what that means is nothing in your life is wasted. All of it is saved up so that you can be raised up from the grave too. The Bible promises you that on the last day when Jesus returns, all the dead in Christ will rise. That is is the most amazing thing that you could ever hear in your entire life. That's the good news, the gospel, that Timothy knew because it was a trustworthy saying that Paul told everybody all the time. And fourth, in Titus 3.8, he says, I want you to insist on these things because they're trustworthy sayings so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to do good works. Christians, listen, We are not perfect people. We mess up. We say dirty words sometimes. Right, Christians? No, no, I would never. I would never do that. Yes, you do. And if you don't say it, you think it. We sin sometimes because we have not been made perfect yet. That's when Jesus comes. But Christian, if you've been washed by the blood of Christ, let me just tell you this. The Bible calls you a holy one, a saint, a good person. Not in and of yourself, but Jesus in you. And so we do good things for people who deserve it the least. Because Jesus died for us who deserved it the least. The gospel, the good news, Jesus came to save us. And Paul preached that gospel everywhere he went. And he says, Timothy, you know what I'm talking about. All those things that I preached, I want you to do something with that. So number two, he wants them, he wants Timothy to grow with others. You need to know the gospel in order to be a disciple-making disciple. And you need to grow with others in order to be a disciple-making disciple. What does he say? It's important. He says, entrust these things to faithful men. Entrust. Notice he actually doesn't say teach it, which I thought was interesting. There is definitely an element of teaching when you are sharing and growing together, where maybe you know something, you're further along in your faith than somebody else is, and so you have to teach them things. You have to show them things in God's word. But Ultimately, what we are doing is we are investing, we are entrusting, we are committing to other people the thing that saves us from our sins. That's the gospel. He's telling Timothy, I want you to entrust this to other people, the gospel with other people all the time. But notice as well, he's entrusting it to certain kinds of people, faithful people. That could mean one of two things. It it might mean both. It could either mean people who have believed in Christ, which I think is probably the case. He's saying, find men who trust in Jesus and grow in your faith in Christ together. But I think it also means the idea of reliable men. So Timothy is to find men who are reliable, who have put their faith in Christ, and he's supposed to invest in them help them grow in their faith which in turn only grows him in his faith anyone who's ever been a teacher or a leader of any kind you know that you learn more than your students do it's always the case and so he's telling timothy you need to know the gospel you need to grow with these other reliable men always talking about the gospel and then number three this is the part that we miss Repeat the process. Repeat the process. Notice so subtly there, he says, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Those men were expected to repeat the process. Sometimes we think we're just supposed to come and be fed. Sometimes we're the one that says, I need a fish today. Please feed me. 
We go to church, we hear the word, and we're like, oh, thanks, that was so good. Sometimes we come and we're like, I need to learn how to feed myself. I need to learn how to fish. Teach me how to read the Bible. Teach me how to study. Teach me how to grow. And that's even better. But so often we forget that we're, we're supposed to be also learning. Just through the preaching of God's word, you can actually learn how to become a disciple-making disciple. Where you say, I'm hungry. I know how to fish. I know how to find the gospel and be fed on God's word. And I am learning how to help other people learn to do the same. I'm learning how to teach other people how to do the same. Could you help somebody learn how to read the Bible? How? How are we going to figure out how to do that? If you don't know how to read the Bible yourself, you know where to start. Learn how to do that. If you don't know how to share the gospel with somebody else, you know where to start. Learn how to do that. But also, if you don't know how to teach somebody else to read the Bible and share the gospel, to teach others to do it also, then you know where to start. Learn how to do that. That's what it means to be a disciple-making disciple. This process, know the gospel, grow with others, and repeat the process. My granddaddy, he was an avid outdoorsman. The man hunted everything that breathed. The man fished all the time. He was an electrician in a paper mill in Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. It was just a matter of hours away from the Outer Banks, the, the coast, and just a matter of hours away from the mountains. He said North Carolina is the best place in the world to live. And I'm not, I don't disagree with him too much. It was amazing. And he was always hunting and fishing and doing things, hiking. And what was amazing is he would always invite his grandkids to come with him. I was five years old when he said, you're going to sit on that chair and you're going to sit there for at least 30 minutes still before I let you go hunting. And as a five-year-old, still for me was this. <laughs> I did my best and he ended up taking me. But you know what's funny? I remember him teaching me all sorts of things. I learned how to fish. I learned how to tie a knot. He had to teach me that over and over and over again. I probably still can't do it to this day, but he taught me he taught me how to hold my gun safely as we walked through the woods. He taught me how to clean things. He taught me how to call turkeys, and he was really, really good at it. He taught me so many things. But you know what else he taught me the whole time? The whole time we're sitting in the woods or sitting in the Bronco or doing whatever we were doing, he's always talking about Jesus. And you know what else he was telling me? He wasn't just telling me about Jesus. He was telling me how important it is to be a soul winner. To be somebody who goes out and tells people about the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for them. He literally taught me how to fish and hunt. And he literally taught me how to go make fishers of men. It is not complicated. And nobody is busier than he was. But he made it his priority to teach me practical things in life to hang out and spend time together and to teach me the most important things in life. I even have in one of my little Bibles that he wrote to me, Brian, be a soul winner. That's the best, most glorious thing you could possibly do. And he said, it's better than hunting, fishing, hiking, and all the rest. It's finding people and helping them know Jesus Christ, be saved from their sins. And I want to tell you this morning, you can do this. You can be a disciple-making disciple. And I think one of the things we as a church, and not just here, but elsewhere, everywhere I've been, there's always been this like lag or, or a, a disconnect on how to do this. Like we understand the principles we just read. Okay, know the gospel, grow with others, and then, and then repeat the process. But what does that actually mean? Like what do I actually do? And you will hear me preach all the time. I will constantly be telling you, parents, 
grandparents, that means you use every opportunity you have to, sh- to share the gospel, to talk about Jesus with your kids and your grandkids all the time. All of the time. Stop talking about the the pointless things. Don't talk about everything else under the sun if you're not going to talk about Jesus ever. Don't get me wrong. You talk about all those things too, but make sure Jesus is the most important thing. That's huge. But what about us? What about us parents and grandparents? Who's investing in us? Who is helping us grow as a disciple? Who's helping the adult who just became a Christian and they, they didn't have a grandma and a granddaddy that helped them walk in their faith. Who's going to help them? What's the process that we're going to follow? And so that's our second question. How can we, at Second Baptist Church, be disciple-making disciples? Well, I hope to give you something that will help. You know, we've been working on a process for a while. It's not a program. It's a process to give you what you need to make disciples like this. See, my job as one of the pastors of Second Baptist Church is to equip you, the saints, to do the work of ministry. I'm to equip you to be able to make disciples. And we want to help you. We want to give you a process to help you make disciples. And we call it discipleship groups or D groups for short. You've already heard us talking about gathering together to worship as a congregation. We've already talked about getting together and doing life in a small group. But now we're talking about digging deep and growing in holiness together through D groups. And this is something I think we've been missing. Everywhere in our church, everyone I talk to about leadership and everything developing in our church, what I hear is we need to reach out to the younger generation. And I'm telling you, Second Baptist Church, the only way to do that is to disciple them. And I hope to give you a way to do it. Discipleship groups are this. They're gender-specific groups of three to five people. And they will meet off campus for a period of 12 to 24 weeks, whatever works for them. And they're doing this in order to hold each other accountable, to fight against sin, to study God's word, and to share the gospel. You get together every week. You go grab coffee or food or whatever, meet in each other's house. There's only three to five people. This is Peter, James, and John with Jesus, right? And you're getting together, you're hanging out, and you're talking about, hey, what you've been reading in God's word this week? What does that mean to you? How's that growing you? Hey, what's some sin you've been fighting against? Any victories? Any defeats? Hey, who, who are you trying to, who's, who is somebody that you are committed to sharing the gospel with? Maybe not all the time, but you're, you're developing a relationship with them so that you can share the gospel with them. And you're holding each other accountable to actually live out the Christian life. And you're growing as a disciple. And then at the end of this 12 to 24 week period of time, what do you do? You start a new group with some different people. And you start it all over again. You repeat the process. You know, we've been talking about D groups in our discipleship classes in the fall and then the spring. And I'm just telling you, this is going to be a major ministry of our church. This is something that we're talking about all the time. You look at the billboard that's out there that's like, this is what we do. That's not just fancy lettering. That's like literally what we actually do. We, lo- we want to glorify God by loving God, loving others, and making disciples. And under making disciples, you will see discipleship groups. Because we want to help you grow in your faith. And it's going to start small with just a few groups here or there. And then it's going to grow exponentially. And I personally, I I have faith in this process. Not because we came up with something amazing and wonderful and, and new. But because it's old. And it's what scripture tells us to do. We're just trying to do what Paul told Timothy. Know the gospel. Grow with others. And then repeat the process. And I believe that God is going to bless this. I believe that this is what he's called his church to do. And so I want you to learn more about it. I don't want you to jump into D groups without knowing what you're doing. There's no rush. This is something that we can learn and grow in together. But it's not something that we can wait forever to do. And so I want to tell you right now, if you're like, I have no idea what Pastor Brian's talking about, then listen, go to our website. 
yoursecondfamily.org. Go to ministries. And under ministries, you will find discipleship. And when you click on discipleship, you will see something called a D group starter guide. And I'm telling you, that has everything that you need to know about a D group. And it's really short. It's not complicated. So don't make it more complicated than it is. It's really simple. And you can go read it there. And you're like, Pastor Brian, I don't do internet stuff. That's totally fine. Call the office. Come by the office sometime. And we will print you out a copy so that you can know what we're talking about. If you want, come to, D, come to discipleship class on Sunday night because we're talking about that there as well. I don't want any of us to have an excuse to say, well, I know I'm supposed to be a disciple-making disciple, but I just don't know how to do it. Second Baptist Church, I'm giving you the way to do it. And it's not from me. This is not something I came up with. We've gleaned from plenty of other churches just trying to follow 2 Timothy 2 too. And we're just trying to see how it works for us as a church. And I want you to know, you can do this. You can live like Paul and you can live like Timothy and you can make disciples. And, and I want for our church to be able to help you do that. So that's how we are going to make disciples. And if you want to know more about it, please ask me. But again, go check that out. But let's put all of this together, shall we? Let's come in and not really land the plane. I've been thinking about this. We're not really landing the plane. It's a bad analogy. What we're really doing is we've been doing all the checks. You know, my dad was a pilot, right? And her dad, Kayla's dad, was a pilot. My dad flew on aircraft carriers, and her dad flew F-16. So they're both super-duper cool, okay? But all of our lives, everything is about airplanes. So forgive me. I, I think about lift and thrust all the time, okay? Airplanes are our life. But we're not landing the plane because we're not stopping. We've done all the pre-checks. We've signed all the paperwork. We know everything's safe. And now we're throttling up to launch off that carrier right now. How do we be the church? What is it that is expected of you? Again, I want this to be super simple for all of us because I need things to be simple and most everybody else that I know needs things to be simple. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it doesn't have to be complicated. There are four things through this whole series that I think God expects us to do as a church, four simple things, and I want to go through them real quick. How to be the church. The first thing that you and I need to do, this is amazing, are you ready? Gather to worship. Number one, gather to worship. What does God expect you to do as the church? Be with the church come on Sunday mornings and gather to worship and and we've used the word regularly right like how often like what does that mean how often first of all let me just stop you right there if we're asking the question well how often am I supposed to come to church you're already asking the wrong question okay the default is church because this is the community the the family that you've been bought to be a part of that's your default your default isn't sleeping in on Sundays. And I know that we have trouble with that. Listen, I have trouble with that. But your default is be with the church to worship. So if you want some words to help qualify, I'll give you regularly and consistently. If you're not regular, well, you could say, well, I come once a month. That's regular. No, that's, that's not really what we're talking about. Okay, that's using the word regular to make excuses. Or consistently, well, I consistently come on Easter and Christmas. Okay, that's not the same thing. That's not what we're talking about. This is your family. This is what God rescued you for, to experience him and worship him together. So just make it your default. There's no questions about what you're doing on Sunday unless you're on vacation or you're sick or something like that is going on. You got some, some special thing that totally makes sense. I won't throw some of our guys under the bus in our small group, but they had things that they were doing and it, was, it made perfect sense for them to go and do those things on a Sunday morning because their default is to gather to worship. So that's number one. What does God expect you to do 
in order to be who you are as the church, gather to worship. Number two, invest in a small group. Invest in a small group. The way we used to say this is come to Sunday school. But what, what I want to do is, is help us think differently about that. It's not just coming to a class. It's investing in people's lives. Ingre- investing in a smaller group of people in the church who really, really know you. Because here's the thing. We're not a gigantic church. We're not a tiny church, but we're not a gi- gigantic church. But I cannot know everything that's going on in your life. Even as the pastor, everyone else in here can't know everything that's going on in your life. So who is, who's going to know what you're going through and who's going to be able to be there when you need them? It is your small group that you are investing in. And we talked about that, didn't we, last week where we were going house to house focusing on specific things. So I won't re-preach the sermon, but you get the point. So two things, gather to worship, invest in a small group, and number three, what we talked about this morning, grow through D groups. You want to be a growing disciple? You want to know how to make disciples? We, we're going to do that. And you can grow by joining or starting a D group. You, you can start a D group. If you've been a Christian for more than like a month, guess what? You can actually start a D group. Come talk to me about it and I'll explain. D groups are for believers to get together and grow together and help each other become disciple-making disciples. And God expects that from us. We know because of the text we read this morning and what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 28. Make disciples. So, so far, in order to be the church, we need to gather to worship. We need to invest in a small group. We need to grow through D groups. And I would say, fourthly, something that we haven't really talked a whole lot about, but I hope is already on your mind, is you need to volunteer to serve in the church. Volunteer to serve. You know, in, in the church world and in the world at large, there's a high impulse for leadership. And that's good. We need people to step up. I think that's what most people are trying to say. Be a leader. That means step up and do the right thing, right? We all need to do that. But you know what else we need? We need people to do the work of ministry. We need people to actually do the work of service. To come and deacons to set up the Lord's Supper so that people can partake. We need people to set out things before church. We need people to make sure the church is operating well. We need people to serve. We need volunteers. We, listen, we got grandmas galore in this church, don't we? Amen. And we need grandmas to come and watch them babies in there. Don't we? Because guess what? There's more coming. Okay? Praise the Lord. And we need volunteers to serve. We need men to make things happen, to go and and help people with things, to go out and serve other people in the church. And there are lots of avenues. And I want to tell you one thing we're trying to do is is help it, make it more. Let me say this right, Brian. (laughs) Lord, help me. We want to make it easier for you to find the place that you're to volunteer and serve. We know what we need to do. We need more people to help us do it. And so you need to be praying about how to do that. We got people driving the bus around, picking up people. We got all sorts of things going on, and we're going to find ways to help you connect. Listen, what does God want you to do as a member of this church? Four simple things. Come to church on Sundays. Go to your small group on Sunday morning and make sure you guys are living life together. Find out more about D groups and get plugged into one and then find a place to serve so that you can make an impact in God's church. Second Baptist, why in the world would we do those four things? You know, if you do those four things, I honestly, I cannot think of anything else that you would need to do. Everything else is is gravy and cake. And gravy and cake are really, really good. Don't get me wrong, but they're not the meal. If you're doing those four things, you're doing everything. 
that a church member needs to do. Why? Why would you do all of that? That takes a lot of time. I understand the commitment. I know it's hard. Why would you do that? Because of what he did? What did he do? He came down into this dead and dying world and died a miserable, disgusting, naked death for you so that you could have everlasting life, so that you could find abundant freedom from your sin, and so that you could live full and free for his glory. And so that's what we're going to focus on now as we continue to worship the Lord. Deacons, if you would make your way forward and and prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper. Deacons, go ahead, come on forward. And we're preparing our hearts. As the deacons are making their way down, church family, I want to encourage you. Remember, the Lord's Supper is for baptized believers who are in good standing with a local congregation. What we're doing together as we take this Lord's Supper is we're remembering Christ's sacrifice. We're proclaiming in faith that he died for our sins And we are believing by faith that he rose from the grave and he is the source of all of our life. And so as we pray, I hope that you are praying and considering this truth as you get ready to remember Christ in your hearts. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.